We'll look briefly at the population structure of cross versus self-pollinators again. We'll talk about some characteristics of cross-pollinated plants. Then we'll talk about the concept of population improvement through recurrent selection. And I will go through this in a very, very shallow and, and a very rapid view because later in November, Dr. Don Vians will come in and give two weeks of very you know, excellent lectures on population improvement mechanisms. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the types of selection you can do and then finish up with the types of cross-pollinated varieties. And of course, that'll lead us into the fact that cross-pollinated crops are either bred as sort of open pollinated varieties or synthetics, or the varieties we develop are F1 hybrids produced by developing inbreds and hybrids. And before we can talk about hybrids on Wednesday, we'll talk about the concepts of inbreeding depression and heterosis. And then finally on Friday, we'll talk about breeding hybrids, which historically has been a type of variety for cross-pollinated crops, but for the last 10 or more years with sorghum and rice, uh, hybrids have also been developed and utilized in self-pollinated crops. So just to, to give you a view of the population structure, self-pollinated crops, heterogeneous population of homozygotes, well, all you can see is lots of variability in the different plants, and you just have to take my word that they're self-pollinated, therefore homozygous. Whereas cross-pollinated crops, heterogeneous population of heterozygotes, a field of maize showing extensive variation. And actually, all you can tell visually is these are heterogeneous populations and not any form of pure line variety. Uh, in point of fact, we develop very uniform pure line varieties with self-pollinated crops. In cross-pollinated crops, we either develop open pollinated varieties of cross-pollinated crops, which aren't very homogeneous, or we develop pure line F1 hybrids, which are very, very uniform, even though they're completely heterozygous. So, so just to, to keep those concepts of heterogeneity and homogeneity and heterozygosity and homozygosity before you. And you've had this before, the crops that are normally self are cross-pollinated. So if you start out with a, one of those plants in that field of maize, open pollinated variety, you harvest it an ear, you plant it out the progeny from that ear, you could get extensive variation in plant height, ear placement, plant size, such that each individual kernel from that ear would have been pollinated potentially by a different source plant. In fact, some of those kernels could have been self-pollinated, in fact, by the pollen from that, own, that, that same plant. Others could have been pollinated by plants that are closely related to this, but within that field, Others could have been pollinated with quite genetically distinct plants. So that uh, if you take the progeny from that ear and grow it out, it doesn't reproduce that parental plant at all. You get everything from things that look like the parental plant to things more vigorous to less vigorous, extreme variation. So since those plants are heterozygous, and the progeny segregate so widely upon selfing or even sub-pollinating. And also, within most of our cross-pollinated crops, selfing leads to this process of inbreeding depression, which reduces the vigor. Uh, breeding systems for these crops are designed to increase the frequency of desirable alleles for particularly quantitative inherited traits and must involve repeated cycles of crossing. So in self-pollinated crops, we could make one cross to generate an F2 population that showed variation, 
but the name of the game was self back to heterozygosity as quickly as you can. And when you get back to homozygous families, then do your final selections for pure line varieties. Cross pollinated crops, you try to self like that and you get in trouble with inbreeding depression. If you keep recombining like that, you don't get uniform progeny from your parental generations. So uh, what you have to do is select and recombine. And then select again and recombine again and then select again and recombine again. Cycle after cycle after cycle. And uh, this is recurrent selection. And as I mentioned, Dr. Vians will give you a, a, a in detail presentation of um, methods for recurrent selection. All right, another major difference then caused by this difference in genetic composition of self and cross pollinated crops. In self pollinated crops, since the progeny basically look like the parents, you know, if you're homozygous at an F5 or F6, then all of the progeny coming from that self plant are fairly uniform and homozygous. So progeny tests are quite useful. In cross pollinated varieties, uh, these progeny tests aren't nearly as useful. So in cross pollinated varieties, the breeder focuses on the population rather than an individual plant because you just can't reproduce that individual plant's genotype in succeeding generations. And progeny tests just don't do you much good. You can do some progeny tests if you do some form of sib pollination breeding, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But by and large in these plants, we utilize test crosses. And what are test crosses? Instead of taking your, your uh, selected plants and letting them or crossing them to each other and bringing those or self-pollinating them actually and bringing those progeny into a trial, you take those heterogeneous and heterozygous plants and you cross them onto a standard tester so that you can more or less fix half of the genetic component of the progeny you're going to test. And your testers can either be highly undesirable materials, if you're breeding for improving disease resistance, you can take a completely susceptible variety or inbred line as a tester and say, okay, only the progeny in my new population that carry resistance to that disease will look good in that test cross if I inoculate with the disease. Or the tester can be a more desirable population that's fairly well adapted and it can either be a very uniform homozygous population such as an inbred line or it can be a heterozygous population such as an open pollinated variety or a single cross or double cross hybrid. So the principle of recurrent selection, we've seen this gains from cycles of selection. You basically start with the original population, select only the top five or the top 10% of the individuals, recombine those in some way, go to the next cycle of selection where you select again the top five or 10% of the individuals and the second cycle so that you move that population mean in the right direction. We talked about this with self-pollinated crops where, where actually you could do this and self, you would select and plan out self populations of selected plants. Here you must recombine every cycle so that you select the best plants in the original population, intercross them to form cycle one, select the best plants in the first cycle, intercross them to form cycle two. So very, very similar process except these are always a step forward to select and then intercross, which is almost a half step back. Then step forward with your selections and intercross. And the reason for that 
is so you can maintain the heterozygous, heterozygous, whoop, heterozygous nature of those plants. All right, for self-pollinated crops, for either mass or bulk selection or pedigree or pure line selection, always at some early generation, the plants are planted out in space plots so you can see individual plants and you can phenotypically select for your characteristics of interest. That works very well in self-pollinated crops. In cross-pollinated crops, we can do that as well, but selecting for strictly qualitatively inherited traits doesn't really give you much advantage in cross-pollinated crops. So you can select for quantitative characters based on visual selection. So what could you select for quantitatively that might hold up to be really due to genetic influences rather than environmental? Well, things like maturity uh, or things like disease resistance or insect resistance. You can use phenotypic selection and even, even if you're dealing with disease resistance controlled by a few genes rather than a single dominant, you can be very successful. You can use this method either in a self or cross-pollinated, and basically you select desirable plants and recombine them by letting them cross-pollinate within the system for cross-pollinated crops. All right, that's useful for some rather simply inherited quantitative traits which maybe that's an oxymoron, but quantitative traits that are inherited by two or three or four genes rather than quantitative traits inherited by dozens of genes. But for most of the quantitative traits that are important to us, we have to use uh, the uh, pro performance of progeny to measure. And as I mentioned, planning out just the cross-pollinated progeny per se is sometimes useful, but crossing your selected plants onto testers and planting out test cross progeny gives you a little more precision. So if you use genotypic recurrent selection, it's, it's much more useful to improve complex traits like yield. So in genotypic recurrent selection, looks somewhat like the list of, of methods you could use for self-pollinated crops. Mass selection is essentially the same concept. Select bulk, select bulk, select bulk, except instead of select self in bulk, select self in bulk, it's select recombine in bulk, select recombine in bulk, and onward. Half sub selection, either with growing out the half sub progeny, or with test crosses, full sib selection, selection from S1 progeny or with test crossers or S2s, and reciprocal recurrent selection. Don Vians will go through each of these methods in, in detail and will actually give you a formula that will help you predict when each of these method, methods is more desirable or less desirable for your specific crop and trait and the, the size of your breeding program, the, the resources available in your program. Today I'll go through several of them just to, to make sure you, you understand what half sibs and full sibs are. And uh, we'll go on from there to talk about not the methods of recombining and selection, but the methods of going onwards to varieties. So half sib selection, you grow out your population, and uh, do you need to go to an F2 population, as we did in self-pollinated crops? Self-pollinated crops, you make that F1, you go to the F2 because it has what? Genetically, what's its composition? That F2 generation has the most genetic variation you'll ever see in that population. The parents are inbred, pure line homozygous, the F1 hybrid, homozygous, homogeneous, but heterozygous. 
the F2 segregates out to show individuals like either parent and between the parents and on either side of the parents. Well, in cross-pollinated crops, you don't have to do that because the individuals that the, the progeny you go out from any open pollinated plant in the field will show more variation than most of our F2 generations from crosses of pure line varieties. So all you do is you grow out your plants, select the best ones, and let them intercross. You harvest the ears from your selected plants and plant a progeny family from each harvested ear. Then you evaluate those families in at least a preliminary yield test and they're called half sibs because within this field you know which plant you select to take the ear from so you know what the female parent looks like but the male parents come from all of the other plants in that field so you know the pedigree of, of the female of all of these new potential varieties but the males are highly variable so with the half sibs, then you can either composite the seed of the best looking plants you select down here in this uh, yield test, or you can go back and say, well, certain plants up here produce the best families down below. I'll go and composite the seed of the parent plants that produce those best progeny. And so that's A versus B. It's actually a lot more efficient and you can get faster gains through cycles of selection if you go back and select the individual plants up here that produce the best progeny. Why is that? Why can't you just select the best progeny here and get just as, as fast a rate of gain as going back and compositing the parents that produce, the, the female parents that produce those progeny. Well, Don will talk about that in detail. Basically, within these progeny, there will be some plants up here crossed with good plants crossed with good plants and produce good progeny. There will be good plants crossed with awful plants producing very poor progeny. And so within this field, you've really got some undesirable genetic types still involved in that open pollination. So if you go back up here, you know that at least half of the genetics of the plants you're advancing produce desirable progeny. That was, yeah. Well, okay, you either composite, you take the ears out of the best plants from this population, grow them out the next generation and let them intermate, or you go back and take the remnant seed from the plants you selected here, grow those out and let them intermate. But down here you do another cycle of intermating so that this becomes your next, you know, this forms the next cycle that you select from or this forms the next cycle you select from. Where does the seed come in from uh, method A? You also take the best ears from the first season. You take the best ears, but when you collect those ears, they could be pollen. You're just selecting good-looking plants. And those good-looking plants could be pollinated by other pretty good-looking plants or so-so plants or terrible plants. When you grow out the progeny, the progeny that were pollinated by two good-looking plants are going to be the best progeny. So if you go back up here, you might have a, a progeny down here that, that actually was not combined with something really desirable. So if you, if you do your, you know, down here, if this and this and this are undesirable rows and that's desirable and this and this and this is undesirable, well, that's going to be pollinated mostly by undesirable genotypes. And, and so you sort of lose ground. So if you go back and bulk the seed that you selected from here, you know that every ear that you put into this composite 
produced a variety down here that was desirable. And it just gives you a faster rate of gain. It's not significantly faster, but it gives you a, a little advantage. Now that's assuming that you can get enough seed in this original recombination generation to have remnant seed to plant. And I should point out, uh, all of these methods, particularly all of these methods for recurrent selection and cross-pollinated crops, were developed with maize. They worked very well with maize. Um, the concepts are valid and, and, and they're, they're, the, the rules work. Uh, when you try to transform these or take them over to other crops, you can run into some problems. Uh, when you run into a crop like alfalfa, you run into lots of problems in terms of getting enough seed produced of these recombinants to have remnant seed. But in alfalfa, you're sort of bailed out because you can vegetatively propagate it. But in some other crops, you have problems. When you go to self-pollinated crops, you know, we like to tend to think they will follow these same rules, and they do. But a lot of our concepts that we're going to develop out of, out of these types of combinations are concepts based on general and specific combinability, which we'll get to Friday. Uh, we've got to remember, they were developed with maize. They work well for maize. They always work well in maize. When you take those concepts over to sorghum or rice or wheat, uh, sometimes we have problems in, in sort of applying and knowing the meaning of, of what the, the, the terms are. All right, so that was just half sieve and you're doing a progeny test. And we figure at least you knew the genetic composition of the female parent, or at least you knew which plant the ear came from and which was the female parent. You can sort of improve your rates of success by bringing a tester parent into play such that if you had a group of half sib families in the field you could either let them open pollinate but at the same time you would manually collect pollen from the plants that you would select at flowering time and you would take that pollen over to cross it onto a tester so that actually what you grow out are these test cross progeny the advantages in that are that you have sort of, you know, if you're using an inbred tester, you have a homozygous uniform genetic base to compare all of the variability coming out of this heterozygous, heterogeneous population against. Quite frankly, in most cases, we don't manually carry pollen from our selected plants to our testers. We plant the testers either around our, our uh, parents, to the, the plots we're going to select from, or intersperse them in rows in between, and we detassel the tester so that the tester can't pollinate itself. So then we know that all of the pollinations that occur on the ears of those testers come from our half sib plants. All right, and you can grow out those test cross progeny pick out the plants that produce the best test cross progeny, then go back and bulk or composite the remnant seed from those individual plants. All right, we can sort of throw a new wrinkle into this and say, well, instead of us letting our selected plants open pollinate. In maize, which is sensitive to inbreeding depression, but not overly so, we can self-pollinate our selected plants and then carry pollen to that tester plant. And so we can get a series of S1s from those tester plants that in themselves are 50% homozygous. And we can evaluate those S1s onto those testers and select the best progeny here and go back and select S1 
remnant seed to bulk and combine. And that actually gives you a little better rate of gain in selection. But of course, every one of these modifications has advantages and disadvantages. The advantages, the S1s, give you sort of help increase the rate of gain you can make per cycle. But you literally have to go in, bag up your selected plants before pollen shed, bag up the ears, sell them, and then carry them to testers to, to cross-pollinate. A lot more time, expense, and labor than just cutting the tassels off those tester plants and letting your, your population open pollinate them. So, so in all of these methods, there, there's sort of endless variations or alternate forms that you can employ. And, and really, the, the endless number of combinations sort of depend on a breeder's personal preference as much as on the crop and the traits that are being selected for. And in fact, to make it even more confusing, different maize breeders call these different methods by slightly different terms. And, and so I caution you right now, this is a case where knowing terminology is good, but when you're just starting to study this, it can really confuse you. So don't worry about what you call them. Just know that half sibs are half sibs because we know that they came from this female plant. So we know what the female plant that produced those progeny looked like. We know the phenotype of that plant. And therefore, we know at least somewhat of its genetic uh, potential. Whereas S1s involve selfing those plants so that not only do we know the phenotype of those plants, but we've actually carried them to 50% homozygosity so that the materials that we bulk to composite for the next generation are really fairly homozygous. Now, what advantage could you get by selfing? I mean, uh, you might select a plant here and say, OK, this looks like a pretty good plant. I'll self it. I'll put it on the testers. And I get down here, and I say, OK, the progeny is all right. I'll include it. So then I'll go back and take the remnant S1 seed and plant it out. What, would you, what could you see in those S1 seedlings that you would not see necessarily in a sibbed seedling? What will segregate upon selfing? What heterozygous loci? And if heterozygous loci self, what ratios do they get? If a single dominus locus selfs, you get a quarter of the plants that are homozygous dominant, a half that are heterozygous and look the same as the dominant, and a quarter that show homozygous recessive traits. And those homozygous recessive traits are often deleterious, if not lethal. So, so that selfing generation allows you at least one early chance to eliminate any plants that are carrying those undesirable recessives. And sort of that buildup of all those undesirable recessive alleles that these heterozygous crops carry, we call the genetic load. That's bad genetics that we're carrying from generation to generation because our dominant alleles mask them and we don't see its effect until they segregate out. All right, full sub selection. If half sub selection means you know the female but not the male, what would you think full sub selection means? You know the male parent as well as the female. So how could you ensure that you know the male parent as well as the female? Well, you go into your generation from which you're selecting, and you don't select one plant. You select two individual plants that are of the same maturity. And you say, OK, I'm going to select 
and cross plant one onto plant two. I'm going to cross plant two back to plant one. And that gives me a full sib pair of hybrids. The hybrids produce cross this way and the reciprocal hybrids that way. So I can grow out full sib progeny rows. And if I know which parents up here, both male and female, produce which progeny, then if I eliminate any poor performing progeny, I can therefore go back and eliminate any plants up here that gave poor progeny. So I can advance only the plants, the remnant seed from this generation that contributed to the best progeny in this next generation. So I can really make gains even faster than with a half sib or with an S1 selection, but at what cost? I have to select pairs of plants and cross-pollinate. And so there's a lot more labor involved. And as a result, you end up selecting either smaller numbers of progeny, full sub progeny to test in each population, or you end up being able to work fewer numbers of populations. So the more time and energy and labor you expend in making those recombinations, the fewer population, the less time you have to spend on other populations or additional progeny. All right? But this also gives us an advantage in that we can get a measure of combining ability between these plants. And probably some of you don't know what combining ability is yet, but uh, starting Wednesday and by next week, we'll talk about the, the ability of plants to combine. All right, so any of those methods that you want to utilize, half sib, full sib, or half sib with S1, half sib progeny, half sib testers, any of those methods are designed to keep a cycle going. Select and recombine, select and recombine, select and recombine. After you've gone through several of those recurrent cycles, you might say, well, wait a minute now. The progeny coming out of this cycle look pretty good. Uh, maybe as good as what the farmers in the area are growing. So I can take the best half or full sub families start putting them in replicated yield test and put them in replicated test a lots of varieties at one year then fewer varieties the second year at more locations select even fewer varieties until ultimately I come up with one selected half sib or full sib variety that I grow in replicated multi-location test with the best check varieties and I can release these as, as full varieties. We'll talk a little bit more about the composition of what, what sort of goes into those varieties in just a minute. But I just wanted to back up as sort of again a prologue for what we'll talk about on Friday. When we also do this S1 test, whether we're doing an S1 progeny test or S1s on the testers, we basically can take those remnant S1 seed and recombine them, and we can then go through recombination and selection, recombination and selection with S1 plants being recombined, so we can go through a recurrent selection with S1 plants, or we can take those S1 progeny take the best plants, self them again, and at the same time put them on a tester, and then self them again and put them on a tester, and we can continue a process of selfing, and ultimately this sort of selection is used or was used initially for the development of inbred parents that could be used to recombine into single cross hybrids. So we won't talk about this until maybe Friday. But another advantage of using these S1s 
and particularly S1s onto testers, and particularly if you can use S1s onto a homozygous inbred tester, is you can really get a head start on the development of new inbreds to use as parents in single cross hybrids. All right, so what are the types of open pollinated varieties that we can develop or cross pollinated? Well, we have land races or what we call open pollinated varieties. And these are randomly produced hybrids selected by breeders or farmers. And farmers often do as good or better job at selecting these open pollinated materials as breeders because farmers know exactly what they need and what they like. And often the breeders don't bother to take the time to talk to the farmer to find out what they need or what they like. All right? We can develop half sub or full sub varieties, which we can develop by recurrent selection, and we can just take half sib ears that we select and say, well, now this looks like it's fairly, you know, it's a little bit more uniform than that mixture I started with, and it's still got good yield potential, so I can release a half sib variety by increasing the seed and distributing it to farmers or a full sib variety. We can even take half sib varieties developed from one breeding population and we can cross those to half sib varieties developed from a different breeding population and through the process of heterosis we can actually get better yielding varietal hybrids than either of those half sib populations alone. And we'll talk the next two classes about why taking half sub materials from two different populations might give you some advantage over just selecting within one population. We can also take, uh, develop a synthetic. And a synthetic is a blend. We can either blend uh, as a blend of ram randomly produced hybrids, we can blend open pollinated varieties, half sib varieties, full sib varieties, or even inbreds. Don Vians will talk about how you produce a synthetic alfalfa variety, and, and, and there are some very, very important steps that you must go through to maintain. We can also develop double or single cross hybrids, produce from developing inbred parents that are selected for combining ability. So we'll talk about some of these guys in just a little bit detail today, and then we'll lead into those for the next two lectures. All right, so land races are open pollinated hybrid varieties. And, and you know, we got to remember, a lot of people say, open pollinated varieties, they have so many characteristics that make them superior to hybrids. Thinking, are you dealing with a cross-pollinated crop like maize? Yeah. Well, then an open pollinated variety is a mixture of hybrids and inbreds, but mostly hybrids. So I don't understand this comparison of open pollinated varieties versus hybrids. What it is, the breeder or farmer selects the best plants and ears from a population. They use the ears from those best plants to plant seed to produce the next crop. They can share, sell, trade whatever that seed to other farmers. But whatever they select depends on naturally occurring variation within the population they plant because in most cases no control is exerted over pollination. So they, they truly select nature's random blend of hybrids. But if it's an open pollinated field of a crop like maize, you can get sometimes a significant percent of selfing of ears from individual plants, or more importantly, you can get sibbing, crossing of plants with closely related plants, so, so that really 
This development of open pollinated varieties or land races as they originally occurred certainly gives us a way to identify naturally occurring variation and select combinations that work better under certain conditions. But it really has two major limitations. You're not exerting any control over what pollen is used to produce the recombinations and that leaves you very much open to the possibility of harvesting ears that might have some very good hybrid combinations among their, their kernels, but could also have some poor hybrids and some selfs getting down towards inbreds. So here is a hybrid. Here is a land race open pollinated variety. And for good or bad, you can develop that hybrid so that every plant in the field has fairly equivalent production capability. Whereas here, it, it's sort of random luck. Some of those plants are going to be very productive and some of them are not going to be very productive. And what you harvest is going to be the average in productivity. And trust me, every time, the average of productivity of a non-controlled blend is going to be lower than the product productivity of a uniform hybrid that's reasonably selected to your environment. All right, so to go the next step beyond that open pollinated materials that we deal with, we can have controlled pollination, and here we can either do varietal crosses, synthetics, or hybrids from inbreds, which we'll defer till next time. Varietal crosses, I said a minute ago, they produce half sib or full sib families, cross varieties from different source populations. Maintain your parental varieties via sibbing so you can recross those same parents year after year after year to produce more seed of your varietal hybrid. Uh, you cross parents via a top cross method in maize. That basically means you take the set of varieties you want to use as females, you plant them out in strips and you detassel them, and around those you plant the varieties you want to use as male, and you let them open pollinate the detasseled females, then you cut out the male plants and harvest only the hybrid ears from the female plants, and you can release those varieties to farmers. Synthetic, yeah. What's sibbing exactly? Huh? What's sibbing exactly? You said you're maintaining your varieties in the sibbing. Sibbing is just the, the uh, pollination of sister plants or related plants. You take, you, you've developed half sib families by letting the plants recombine and selecting from the female plants that are best. You just continue to go through your cycle of recombination and selection of half sib. So that in year one, you take the half sib progeny and you cross them to produce the hybrid. But then three years later, you've got the next generation of those half sib, but the same family basically. Nothing else has been added in and you just maintain them through half sibbing or full sibbing if, if you have the resources and the expenses to do the full sibbing. So synthetics, I pointed out, they're constituted from reproducible units, either inbreds, hybrids, open pollinated varieties. You identify the superior lines based on performance or again combining ability, which we'll talk about the rest of the week. You constitute the synthetic by random intermating of the superior parents. You bulk equal quantities of seed for what you'll distribute to the farmer. You release the varieties. And again, the selected parents are maintained through whatever mechanisms. And as I pointed out, uh, probably the, the ultimate development of varieties in cross-pollinated crops are hybrids from inbred parents. But before we talk about that, we need to spend time talking about inbreeding depression, heterosis, combinability, and then we need to talk about how do you produce those hybrids. Uh, Wednesday, we'll talk about inbreeding depression and heterosis and the value of that heterosis 
in terms of increasing productivity. And on Friday, we'll talk about F1 hybrids and uh, how you go about developing inbred parents, producing hybrids, and identifying hybrids and producing them. All right, questions. We can do this at any time. You can read through this. It just sort of shows self-pollinators. You select, you get the F1. Then you want to get back to homozygosity before you can get new varieties. Over here, you select, you get the F1. Then you select and recombine. I think that's the last one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You have them. You, you identify them and you label them. It, it depends on how advanced you are. If 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 you've developed a program like Simmet's maize program, they would basically develop half sib families from all sorts of different grain type and maturity type populations, and and so they would maintain a white dit early maturity type of population just by full sibbing and you, f you do those in isolation from yellow dents or white flints or yellow flints or late maturities or whatever. But basically you just let your, your uh, progeny that you want to use in cross recombine in isolation so that only parents from the material within your selected pool are used to increase the next generation of that pool. No, never can. That's one of the problems with uh, cross-pollinated crops. It's hard to get that same composition of heterozygous material two years in a row, unless you go through this complex process of making homozygous inbreds and then recrossing those to produce hybrids. Yeah. Exactly, and and if. If they're half sibbed, you have the this, this same half genetic composition. I mean, because you're only selecting the female plants and you don't know what came in as males, but you try to put them in an isolation so that only other of your half sib selected female parents pollinates each other. And you can do, you can get some fairly, you know, you don't get uniform inbred looking materials, but you get families that show some variation but not extreme variation. So, yeah, you can get some half head families that look, you know, sort of semi uniform. There'll be off type plants all through it. With full sib, you can get even better because full sib. We'll also point out see, you know, sibbing is, is a form of inbreeding. So, sort of when we talk about, if I talk about it next time, if you're inbreeding, the, the, the most drastic form of inbreeding is selfing. That's where you go from 50% to 75 homozygous to 87 to 94, boom, boom, boom. But sibbing is just a slower form of inbreeding because when you sib plants, you ultimately don't have a lot of heterozygous loci that are different.